Yes, I think that uh, he's probably got out of it pretty well, Ted. This, there is a couple of reds that will go, but nothing easy. So may even just play a safety shot. Yes, red and decided to take no risks whatsoever, trying to force Jimmy White into leaving him a clear-cut opening. You'll notice the pink and blue well amongst the pack of reds there. Black sits on the blue spot, so red and with a red will want to get on that black ball. difference of 15 points has now been there for almost six minutes. I have a feeling it's about to alter. confident pot there by Jimmy White but a typical Five. last frame of the session there's a long way to go in this yet Jimmy White just leading by 24 points, points to four and trailing by one frame so nine more frames to play here this evening we'll be back tonight and uh, the question will be solved whether Jimmy White justifies his position as favorite to beat the old campaigner Ray Reardon and third favorite behind Steve Davis and Terry Griffiths to become the new champion later tonight hope you join us bring you a nightly look at what matters to the people of seven counties. Every day from Monday to Friday, South Today brings you the news, the sport, the personalities, and the politicians, the people and the events which shape our lives. The big stories, the odd stories, the funny stories, the moments of triumph, the moments of drama, the moments of tragedy. We bring you the arrival, the departures, the South in all its moods from sunshine to storms. Wherever it happens, the South Today team is there to bring it to you. So join us every weekday on South Today. Beware of imitations. Well, we apologize for the loss of picture there. Back to this afternoon now on BBC One, and it's time for Great Railway Journeys of the World. This week, Changing Trains with Eric Robson. here is the end of Europe's golden age of steam railways. The old night ferry has left this platform at London, Victoria, bound for Paris and Brussels for the last time. It wasn't much to ride home about. All that clanking and shunting on the channel boats made it the most insomniac of sleeping trains. And yet it was the very last link with the days when European rail travel was still an adventure. Britain's last international passenger train. A hangover from an age no more than a generation ago, when this was the only way to travel. For a hundred years, excited passengers have been crossing these platforms. Posh English trippers, off to the preferred watering holes of Montreal or Biarritz. Politicians or shady agents, en route to the melting pot of the Balkans. But mainly, just people who liked a bit of adventure, 
off to join the eastbound steam hall, Orient Expresses. And now I'm travelling east too. How far I'll have to go to find traces of those old days, I just don't know. For much of the journey over the Alps, I'll be travelling in the best trains that modern Europe has to offer. But above all, this is a journey of the imagination. A journey through a world of railways that's already gone. Try to think of the way it used to be. Perhaps you've got fond memories of travelling this way in the 40s and 50s, when there was all the time in the world, and the steam still carried with it a surge of excitement. The view from the window was just a B feature before the main attraction. you'd considered going by one of those aeroplanes that were already forcing such changes on long-distance trains. But you decided against it. What you wanted was a cruise by railway, and the travelling was a holiday in itself. was worth saving up for and great fun while it lasted. Perhaps it was never quite so good as memory and the movies would have us believe. Have you forgotten the noise and the soot? Do you remember the drafts and delays? Perhaps not. What remains in the mind's eye is the image of a dash across Paris and boarding a train to distant places at the Gare de Lyon. You still can. So what takes our fancy? Milan or south to Marseille? The east, perhaps, through Vienna to Budapest in the track of the Stambul train. Well, certainly a trip to the east will give us more chance of finding steam trains, and it'll show us a lot more railways. That's why we won't take the direct route. We've got a week to travel, a week of changing trains, stopping where we like, and starting with a touch of class. Sur Transeurope Express 23, le 6 Alpin, départ 12h15 en première classe. Attention, ce train est 3h46. Au milieu du train, après la voiture part. Au milieu. Vous parlez anglais Yes, ma'am. Yes. You are in the middle of the train, car number 8. Le 6 Alpin, Trans Europe Express, may not have the romantic look of earlier trains. But it has its compensations. Another worth bearing in mind in future is it always leaves on time. There isn't a better way to start our journey. These are the first class continental trains, the internationalist dream, running across the frontiers of a dozen countries in much the same way that the luxury coaches of the Wagon Lee Company did a hundred years before them. Le Cis Alpin, getting us to our first destination on Lake Geneva in four and a half hours of quiet, air conditioned comfort. The first thing to do, of course, is to weigh up our fellow travellers. They're certainly not the elite bunch who would have journeyed with a century ago. I guess there isn't a middle European king or end-of-the-line archduchess amongst them. Hardly a spy or an arms dealer. Just the routine traffic of our more mundane, multinational business. Yet we're in the debt of those early trains, the privileged expresses that eventually extended the privilege of travel to the rest of us. Before them, we were bound in by the narrow circles of city or village life, until the tracks went over the horizon.
monsieur, dame. Vous désirez pièce de bœuf ou volaille Merci. Of course, some of the early delights of train travel are still with us. We can still nibble at the pleasures of the rich and famous. Fast food has a different meaning on Trans Europe Express. In the best traditions of wagon lit service, the waiters still get by in three or four languages. Still assume that we recognize the dishes on today's menu as old friends. But are still prepared to discuss with a quiet American what's the next best thing to Californian claret. Admittedly, you won't get out for much less than £10 a head, but perhaps that's only to be expected in a restaurant with one of the best views in Europe. into Switzerland, accomplished with the smoothness of a hundred years of practice. It's a seven-minute stop, just long enough to take the customs and immigration men on board and change engines. But that's the flaw in the system. These Trans-Europe Expresses, born in the 50s, were going to unite Europe as never before, using the same trains everywhere, taking their bookings by computer. They've already failed. Merci. The locomotives may be all electric, but there are still four different voltages in use in Europe. The network, controlled by a different country every four years, hasn't been able to agree on the type of service to offer, or even something as simple as the colour of the trains. The railways are as nationalist a business now as they were when the staff of the Orient Expresses smoothed the unfamiliar business of passport control. Soon, perhaps, Le Cis Alpin will be as out of place and time as the great European resorts the railways created. Soon its arrival at Lake Geneva will be no more than a picture for the scrapbooks. A photograph pasted a few pages on from the holiday snaps of earlier days. From the years when this corner of Switzerland was little England in the season. The well-to-do came to Montreux to take the Alpine air and have a last fling before the sun set on the Golden Age. Some, like K. Dalrymple, stayed. A lot of people have passed through here. They seem to be rather quiet people. Whether they came here to recollect themselves, because it was a beautiful spot and it was quiet and the view is magnificent and you have the lake, which is in those days not polluted. So it was quiet making. You could go for trips on the boat. From here, people went up to Glion, which is very easy with the little trains, or to Co which they did a lot, of course. And it was a, a relaxing place. A place packaged by the railway companies. Wagon Lee was here, and hotels to match the excellence of their trains. They used to have the dancing here in what is now the music room. And they had a band there, and we used to have tea and dance in the middle of the room, very sedate, with our chaperones, of course. And we had our private parties, we had our dances, of course, we had our special group. And we used to go to what's now the Hazy Land, which was called the Pavillon des Sports in those days. You could go every afternoon and have tea there and dance. And now and then we had a concert. There was a lot of dancing in the Grand Hotel, which had a big room for people used to come there. I feel it's one of the places you can go and live when you're very old. But otherwise, I wouldn't come here. <laughs> it's too noisy now. There are new attractions. The commonplace of Quai Dalrymple's day, preserved in axle grease in the hills above Montreux. 
Once the line from Blonay to Chambly was one of a hundred rural steam railways. Now it's three miles of track and worked by amateurs. The part-time world of Preservation Society President François Bossard. Uh, you know that in life we do sometimes, I would say, a little bit of dreams of childhood, where we try to find what we had lived before. And my first interest has not been for the road to the river directly, but for the bateaux à vapeur. And I had a grandfather who was an engineer like me, who had taken me on the bateaux à vapeur du lac, where we saw encore. Euh, les machines à piston, il y en a encore quelques-unes. Et c'est lorsque, en 1968, j'ai entendu parler qu'il y avait une société qui allait se constituer pour, euh, pour remettre en service et conserver du matériel à vapeur. Je me suis dit, eh bien voilà, un bateau à vapeur, c'est très grand. Une machine, ça sera un petit peu plus petit. Je me suis intéressé, je me suis approché. Et maintenant, ça fait des années que j'œuvre à cette société. The passion of Monsieur Bossard, firing the imagination of a new type of visitor. I've got a Schaffner coming up nice. Come on, Charlie boy, keep coming this way. That's it. They're a bit different from milords and ladies who used to live it up here. For one thing, they actually want to get close to the machines that frighten the horses. So if we go down to the end there, we can get her coming back down yeah. there tender first. Mm -hmm. She reverses at Blonay, and we can pick her up again somewhere near the tunnel now. Yeah. An ecstasy of rivets and steam pipes that export manager Bill Albra has captured for a more modern package holiday market. We began way back now, about 1970, I suppose it would be, when really, after having been on two or three other people's trips and found that in a lot of instances here they were traveling overnight for most of the time, we thought that getting a bit older and a bit wiser, this sort of thing, we try and put people up in reasonable quality hotels and get a lot of fun out of it. You know, wine, women and song as well as steam train. What I'd like to know is if they're going to put the uh, Fokker Opera rack tank back in order. Mm. But you know, really, she's pretty classic in French lines. Oh, very much so. Yeah. If I proves me wrong, it's it? cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But do you remember when we were in the States earlier this year, we were having a problem with the Americans. We can let's face it, the Americans don't know much about running railroads anyway, do they? <laughs> yeah, I've just come back from East Germany a fortnight ago, and I was in South Africa at Easter. Uh, last year, I managed to visit about ten different countries, actually, although not all in the pursuit of steam trains. We went to uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, um, Romania. Can I mention Yugoslavia? Um, several places i can't really remember them all now. i like travel and i also like railways and if you put the two together the one makes a very good excuse for the other it gets in the blood you know it's uh, very much steam in the blood i suppose run of Europe's newest luxury train. This season you can travel through the scenery of Switzerland's Golden Pass in the comfort of the Mountain Pullman Express. At the end of the blonay Chambly line in 1931, you could pick up not just any old Pullman, but the only narrow gauge Pullman in the world. An electric train just out of its box, taking the corners like a Hornby model as it wound its way to the smarter ski resorts of the Bernese Oberland. Luxury had even found its way off the beaten track. Today it's a two-hour kaleidoscopic trip in the Panoramic Express. Tourists, the breed that first inspired these railways, are still its most important customers.
private, narrow gauge Montreux Oberland Bernois railway has made its living since the turn of the century by bringing trippers round the mountain to Schweitzimmer. At which point all changed to the less panoramic rolling stock of the private but this time standard gauge Bern Lurchberg Simplon railway. It's just across the platform, our connection for the hour long haul to Interlaken. This is certainly not the route for people who object to changing trains. Across Switzerland, you could take almost a hundred journeys and never use the same railway company twice. Interlaken spoils you with its choice of liveries. Switzerland's just a giant train set, really, where generations of fathers and sons have added more track and extra trains whenever it's taken their fancy. With the single-mindedness of men who make railways their hobby, the Swiss are even prepared to pay for them when they lose money. And anyway, in a nation suffering from referendum disease of epidemic proportions, it's almost impossible to get agreement to close them. Mind you, the private companies don't have the layout entirely to themselves. There's even a proper state-owned system. Our fourth train of the day is on the only narrow-gauge line of the Swiss Federal Railways. This is the Switzerland of the less energetic Victorians. Not the high Alps, but the fringe of the mountains. A view of the snow from the comfort of a travelling rug and a good book. And over there, Meieringen, where Sherlock Holmes had his nastiest encounter. Then the climb, not relying on legs, too steep for ordinary wheels. We're on the rack, a painfully slow 20 miles an hour, as the teeth of the cogwheels under the engine and carriages wind us more than 3,000 feet to the top of the Brunig Pass. silent running at the summit before we're plunging into the 1 in 10 or 1 in 12 gradients. We drop to the shores of the lake of the four forest cantons and a night in Lucerne. Make the most of it, there's a stiffer climb tomorrow. third day, and one that'll have to start without breakfast if we're to see this, our eighth train, being loaded. The early morning up goods, just about to climb out of its terminus on the other side of the lake. This is the milk round, the brewery dray, and the fruit and veg van, all rolled into one, for the people who live without a road on Rigi Mountain. It's the school bus, too, and at the other end of a life, the ambulance or the hearse. Picturesque and quaint it may be, but the Witznau Rigibahn isn't surviving for any reasons of sentiment. It's been getting the mails and the supplies through without a break since the day in 1871, when in the middle of the turmoil of the Franco-Prussian War, it was opened as Europe's first mountain railway.
once it was a steam trip all the way. Steam-driven paddles to the Witznau Pier, then behind kneeling black locomotives to the top of the mountain. They still dust off engines from the 1920s every summer, because the Rigi is a special occasions railway as well. For the people of Lucerne, it's the very place to hold a birthday party, to celebrate an engagement, or to toast a bride. certainly need a head for heights. When Mark Twain travelled this way, he felt that the one in five gradients, and being quite so close to the edge, provide a good opportunity for remembering his sins and repenting of them. Today it's the Japanese who are among the best party customers, but mainly it's still the Swiss themselves, having an ethnic knees up, while congratulating themselves for having the nous to hang on to railways that other less sensible nations may have closed a generation ago. If you haven't been invited to the party, you can always console yourself with the view from the top. up, yes of course you've guessed, comes down by a different railway and a separate company on the other side. The Art Goldau Rigibahn may be something of a poor relation to other blue trains in the world. But because the Swiss take everything, and particularly railways, with the utmost seriousness, it still connects at the bottom of the mountain with the federal mainline expresses to Zurich. There's always something reassuring about railway stations in the morning. The victory of timetable efficiency over human weakness we may not be sufficiently awake to know what day of the week it is, but the railway has already been up and about for hours. Whilst we are still marvelling at how these strange Europeans can really eat salami and drink schnapps at breakfast, our train has already been dressed for the day. But I suppose everything should run smoothly here. They've had enough practice after all. Since the very first departure of transcontinental railways, this has been the turntable of Europe. When the Swiss are being very British and refuse to bring their clocks into line with the rest of their neighbours, the ripple runs through the timetables of half a dozen countries. Whether you're travelling west to east like us, or north to south, you can scarcely avoid using Switzerland as a staging post. This station alone handles a thousand trains a day. Long after the prestige of railways died, guards and drivers here are still engaged on work of national importance, and they have a uniform to prove it. 
and they were experts in courteous passenger handling long before airports began to abuse the privilege. And most remarkable of all, it seems that wherever you come from, they actually understand what you say. This is for all the way to Vienna. I don't have to change anymore. Thank you. 430, 384 dollars. 484. Air Bremsgewicht 554. The departure. To the Swiss, a moment of religious observance. It would, of course, be a sin if the train was late. Express train Transalpine to Innsbruck, Salzburg, Vienna. Attention, departure. The Transalpine, and the longest part of our journey. Ten hours to Vienna, another border crossing, the track of the Austrian state railways, and the sweep of the Tyrol. simply the best train the Österreichische Bundesbahnen has to offer. The star of this single main line to the east. settled into the routine. The first hours belong to the scenery. But then, even in the Tyrol, you begin to feel you've seen that bit before. The train turns in on itself, with the polite bow that summons you to lunch, and starts to take on the feeling of a not unpleasant 70 mile an hour hotel. It's got all the same advantages, a captive audience, people to overhear, anonymity if you want it. We know why we're booked in, but surely you've often wondered, what makes someone want to work here? That waiter, for example. Or the chef. How can he possibly turn out haute cuisine in a broom cupboard? The unterschied is to a gross küche that man, sagen wir, weniger Weg zurückzulegen hat. Und der zweite Grund, warum ich hier arbeite, ist der, dass ich erstens einmal relativ viel Freizeit habe und dann doch irgendwie in Europa ein bisschen umherkomme und andere Leute und andere Städte sehe. You can understand why the manager does it. It's fun being boss, in charge of the mobile staff. But how do you get the top job on a five-star train? Vor 25 Jahren habe ich bei der österreichischen Bundesbahn als Schaffner begonnen. Zuerst bei den Güterzügen, später dann bei den Personenzügen im Nahverkehr, noch etwas später dann bei den Schnellzügen. Seit circa zehn Jahren bin ich Zugführer hier bei den Schnellzügen. Und meine Aufgabe ist, den Zug vor der Abfahrt vorzubereiten. Das heißt die Wagen zu notieren, das Gewicht dem Lokführer zu sagen, wie lang der Zug ist, wie schwer der Zug ist. Und für alle Besonderheiten beim Zug bin ich eine Frage. Fine. 
Oh, nice. nice. Okay. Right okay. up, guys. Now, this is the beauty of our journey with a camera. We can stop where the Transalpine doesn't. We can take a roll of film and join the other British visitors on a railway straight out of the pages of Thomas the Tank Engine. The Zillertal Barnes tank engines are rather more aristocratic names, and sadly they don't have a fat controller. But they do have Derek Mayman, who's very kind to them. Every year he leaves briefcase and business suit at his factory in the Midlands and slips into something more comfortable, the overalls and oily rags of the footplateman. It may be his holiday, but it's no less serious a business. If one comes to work, then one's got to take a proper turn and do somebody's work right through through the shift. You can't expect people to come on first thing in the morning, put everything ready, just for you to step onto the footplate and, uh, uh, and do the easy stuff. So you've really got to take somebody's place and do the whole job, otherwise it's not a fair deal, is it? This is no part-time railway. For the people who live and work along the valley from Yenbach here on the main line, up to the terminus at Meyerhofen, the Zilla is as important as any intercity express. Freight is transferred, wagons and all, from Austrian state railways onto its two-foot private track. Unlike its nationalised neighbour that needs millions of shillings in subsidy every year, this line just about breaks even with a little help from its friends. If you hate railway museums with all those lifeless, frozen exhibits, then this is the place to come. Here they don't worship steam engines. It's just good sense to attract thousands of railway collectors every year. It makes the balance sheet look healthier. They leave it to us to be romantic.
It's an interlude we can recapture in our holiday snaps. But we'll have to keep travelling. The Zilla is a gem, but it doesn't have proper steam engines. You know, big ones on mainline trains. Can I have some more film, please, Steve? Perhaps we'll find those where the Transalpine is taking us. We settle down for the tail end of our journey. Woken up by the shunting at Rosenheim as we run into Germany for a few kilometers. Snoozing again by the time we get to Salzburg. Charting our position by glimpses of passing stations and the clock in our stomachs. We want to point out that there is a restaurant car in this train and we ask you to kindly take advantage of this service. The direction to the restaurant car is indicated by an illuminated arrow in the corridor of your coach. Thank you. Should we thank the lady who tempts us to the dining car? Where does she go between announcements? Meine Damen und Herren, Schnellzug 249 von Sarganz über Innsbruck, Kitzbühel und Zell am See mit Kurswagen von Kehl über Stuttgart und München fährt ein. Bitte Vorsicht. Tonight, Chris Lohner will already be back at her proper job, announcing on Austrian television. Her calls to dinner and welcoming arrivals are sadly nothing more than cassettes. It started out very funny because somebody asked me if I could do the announcement in English, French and German for the Transalpine and that was it. And I thought that was it too. But actually, it was the beginning of a whole lot of work, and now I end up doing all the announcements for the Austrian railways. And I really enjoyed it. It's a complete different work from what I do, you know, usually I work on television, I talk in the radio, where there is much more personal engagement in it. I mean, you don't engage yourself by doing an announcement when the train leaves or arrives. I mean, you don't show any feelings or you are happy or unhappy. I mean, actually, it doesn't matter. You just stick to the text and you do it as it is being asked from you, you know. Wir treffen in Kürze in Wien ein. We will arrive in Vienna in a few minutes. Nous arriverons dans quelques minutes à Vienne. Wien, It's everything we expected Vienna to be. Good food and tasteful music. A little restaurant up in the woods somewhere. Except it's the station calf. We won't find many railway pie jokes on the Westbahnhof. Here the station is more than somewhere to depart from as quickly as possible. It's a place to eat and meet by choice rather than necessity. But once, you could have looked out from the platforms of the old Westbahnhof and seen that this was not a place of happy meetings. The trains still came, as if life in Vienna was running on schedule. The Nazi Orient Express brought officials of the high command, and the next train to arrive on platform two carried the red star of occupation on its smoke box door. But whoever came, the people still died in the rubble, and the old world of pre-war railways died too, amid the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The survivors of Europe put on a new face. There were new appointments to keep, but the old prestige expresses would no longer carry people to them. They were symbols of an age we wanted to forget.
It's only with the distortion of memory that we smile a little and pretend they could have survived. Mind you, bits of those old trains do survive, after a fashion. Meine Damen und Herren, Expresszug 263 Orient Express nach Bukarest to the Hague Salon. There's even a remnant of the Orient Express, a fallen woman of a train now, a grubby daily to Bucharest that scarcely justifies the honour of being called an express at all. Once the most capitalist of trains, it's now had its name pinched to boost the business on a cheap run to Romania. The routes that once echoed to first-class passenger traffic are now been usurped by freight. This is what brings prestige to the railways now. This is where profits grease the sliding away of national frontiers. Here today, hull tomorrow, in a roundabout of heavy haulage that leaves lorries standing and notches up one small advance in the battle with the airlines. It's the passengers that have been in retreat because people simply aren't as profitable, not a patch on containers. But if we pause for a moment in a corner of the Vienna Sudbahnhof, we can watch nervous preparation for the arrival of a special passenger train. The Chopin Express has found a role for itself across these borders of Eastern Europe. This is a train for poor people. Everyone here knows it as the emigrant train. Arriving at dawn each day from Moscow, the compartments of the Chopin carry among their passengers the flotsam of political repression. Little scenes from other people's lives. Carrying everything they own, these are the families and bits of families that count themselves lucky. Lucky to have got the exit visa, which allows them freedom after perhaps years of struggle. For these people, Vienna is the neutral stronghold where the struggle stops. For us, it's a new start, too. A journey to the fringe of the world that they've left behind. Five days out from London, we're going to raise a corner of their curtain and slip across the frontier into Hungary. It can be a nervous moment, waiting for the train to leave. Will it be as sinister as preconceptions and imagination have told us? Is it significant that the Lehar Express is our 13th train? We'll know soon enough. There's just an hour of Austria left until we arrive at the checkpoint called Hegye Shalom. I suppose this is what we expected. Soldiers, guns, a search of the train while we're invited to change our money. Where are you going? Change money. Change money? Change money? Yeah. How much? How much uh, do we have to change? Thank you. Thank you. A change of engines, too. Or at least this one brings a dining car with it. It's taken just half an hour to check our passports and visas four times and send us on our way. Three hours to Budapest. 
tracking the Danube across the northern plain of Hungary. Running through a flat landscape that still bears the scars of its history. This is the poor end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, fought over and bartered in a score of European conflicts. In the last war, levelled in punishment for not knowing what side it was on. And always, the railways were destroyed, because military men, at least, know how important they are. Rebuilding has been a slow business, because Hungary had little help. Its new masters had long memories and saw the advantages of a generation of poverty. But eventually, business sense prevailed. They didn't have to like the West to trade with them, and trade needed trade routes, the access to markets that new lines through Hungary provided. Tourists like us are a bearable inconvenience too. We bring hard currency, and if it's necessary to woo us with the frivolity of flowers and a glass of wine on the table, then so be it. We'll be made welcome, unofficial. At Kaleti Station, our terminus in Budapest, the rules will be bent a little. The hand of state enterprise can't entirely cover the fact that this is a capitalist city, a city that just can't be persuaded it's not part of the West. It's not surprising. Families have shared Vienna and Budapest ever since the old extravagant days of Austro-Hungary. It'll take more than a new line on the map to break the habit. The government has given in. Austrians no longer need a visa to come here. Magyar Alam Bosutok, the Hungarian state railway, brings them from the border in their thousands. They come to buy food that's cheaper than at home. The story goes that the Viennese used to come here for their Viennese sausage. They come now to stay a while with the other half of their family and grumble together about this or that new Russian interference in their lives. And that's another thing they have in common. Neither the Austrians nor the ordinary Hungarians count the Soviet Union among their friends. It would be to forget their history if they did. The people of these twin cities that straddle the Danube recognize that state control for all the faults of the people who wield it has its advantages. And nowhere are they more clearly seen than in the plan for transport. Buddha and Pest can boast a truly integrated transport system. On the foundations laid by Hungarian private enterprise, because after all, Hungary was in at the start of the age of railways, the state has provided cheap, efficient travel for the people. Railways outgrew the financiers who conceived them. They became the great levelers, a socialist ideal. If we travel a little further, six or seven kilometers into the forest above Budapest, we can find the nursery of that ideal. Children run the pioneer railway, learning to be Hungary's railwomen and railway women of the future. It's important in this society, too, to know how to run the trains on time. Uttörő vasutas pajtás vagyok, az uttörő vasutat 
úttörők irányítják. 1950-ben indult meg az úttörővasút. A ide jó tanulók kerülhetnek 10 és 14 év között. Ha valaki továbbra is itt akar maradni, itt maradhat ifiként. A vasutas pajtások közül sokan válasszák hivatásukként az, a vasutat. The people of the new railway. So are we too late to catch the generation of steam that we came so far to find? Almost, but their tracks led us to another frontier, on a reservation up near the border with Czechoslovakia. There they were. Dinosaurs grazing. Feasts from the mythology of railways still a potent reminder of past endeavors. But no mainline train is entrusted to them now. They'll shunt freight into a brief twilight and then be allowed to go cold. It'll fall to the enginemen of Hungary to damp down the fires of European mainline steam. But when they do, it'll be with the conflicting sentiments of nostalgia and practicality experienced by men of the same breed in Doncaster or Crewe. Hát őt nagyon dolgoztam 30 évig, nagyon szerettem, nagyon a szívem nőtt. Te tekintettel arra, hogy modernizáltunk, újabb dízelmozdonyokat kaptunk, eleket is szeretni fogom. Természetesen könnyebb lesz nekünk a munka vele is, hát azért szeretem majd a dízelmozdonyokat is. Hát én sajnálom egy kicsikét a gőzmozdonyt, mert abban nevelkedtem, abban nőttem föl, és most már megöregettem, így most már én úgyis nyugdíjban megyek, és a dízelek fognak most már jönni. A dízelek a jobb kényelmesebb, Mind a gőzös, ugye tiszta a munka, hát azért hát ezen is kell járni valakinek, mindig ki nem járhat a motorot. traveled a thousand miles to be with them at the end. On the way we saw many of the successes and some of the failures of the railways that replaced them. We found some countries passionate about railways as never before, and we're returning to a country with less resolve. We knew this was an image living long after its day, but we also knew it was worth seeing it before it faded for the last time. If we travel this way again, many more modern parts of the railway networks may have disappeared as well. There's already a new generation of European railway design.
Out of the factories come trains that, like intercontinental jets, put real speed into travel and take every other scrap of pleasure out. Perhaps then we'll long for a reminder of the gentle Cisalpin. Perhaps we'll wish we had a moment to catch breath at Zurich, that the landscape was more than just a blur. But then it won't be so bad. Whichever way the trains go, we can still use our imagination. At the same time next week in the last of the series, Michael Wood takes the Zambezi Express from Cape Town to the Victoria Falls. And a new video cassette produced by the BBC called Great Railways Volume 1 is available from retailers. Now on BBC One, Ticket to Ride. Score years from the little light of green. I'm going from the Liffey down to Killaloo. I'm the name that I go by as old Johnny Do. Of all, of all the trades are going well, the begging is the best. For when your bag is tired, you can sit and have a rest. I'll just skip around the corner for there's nothing else to do. With his rags and his tags and his old skidoo. Blustery showers today, I'm afraid, with west-southwesterly winds, force 5, sometimes gusting to force 7 or 8. The outlook is for broken weather over the next day or two, with more general rain to follow. Ah, mint sauce! Mint sauce! It's the bell! Zem, 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 Dear Mum, week two and I'm still in Ireland. The weather has changed a bit since last week. I'm off to Ballybunion today and I have to cycle up a blooming great hill called the Tim Healy Pass. P.S. Still no sign of Grandad. Yeah, you're coming for seaweed back, Mike. Are you sure it's going to do me any good? Yeah, it won't do you any harm anyway. There's nothing in there. Yeah, no. no it... Morning, Sean. Oh, yeah. How are you? All right. Mm -hmm. They're going to throw one of these seaweed bats. Yeah. Right? 
some people run out there on the sea and have a swim afterwards, but that's up to yourself, you know? Well, I'll try it. Yes. It looks very cool, that sea. It's cool. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't like the look of them things. You sure this is going to do me good? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. They're very popular anyway. There's no crabs in there. No, there? no crabs. You see what happens now? It's brown and appears when I put it in, like. Yeah. And all that, the hot water brings all the good out. The side end and stuff looks good for your skin, like, you know? Yes, I can actually smell it coming yeah. out. You don't need soap, do you? No, no, no. It's starting to go green, as you can see, look. Oh, you can see it changing yeah. color. I won't go green as well, though. No, 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 no. Your temperature of your own life. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. He came out the bar, he ran over a dog. If I should sell me fiddle, the world would take me back. Tuesday, and today I'm going to the middle of the back of beyond to see a bloke called David Gunn. He makes barons and his missus plays the melodeon. Have you keep these, mate. Oh, keep eating the fish. So this is where you make them? Eh? Oh, yes. That's why we make them now. We started when we get the plywood now. Mm -hmm. So it's a three millimeter plywood. Do you steam it? And we steam it. We have no electricity here, like we have nothing. We only just, we said, only peat. We put mm -hmm. on a big old pot. No big old boiler, we boil them out. Yeah. You and you, you get it, bend it round? Yes, we bend it on, we put on the chain that in it here. And what's the skin made of? Oh, the skin is made out of goat. <laughs> this is a fight goat, a real snow fight goat now. See, that skin is lovely and white. We, you, we put it all into the river, into a river. Yeah, to soak it. Yeah, to, and, to, and it, the river all then washed the dirt away from the skin for nine days. And you, you put it on when it's wet? And then we, we, we stretch it in, we stretch it into a big panel. Yeah. You no know, big panel now. We stretched out for, for the, we said, three days in the big panel. Yeah. Until it dried out. Can you tell about a goat that's going to make good skin? It's a mountain goat. Mountain goat? Yeah, it's a mountain goat. See, that stick must be nine inches.
Oh, there you again, isn't it? Oh, it's just too cold. Very early, David. I might see you next year, David. Right, right. When I come over for the flat. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. See you, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Joe. Bye. Bye. I'll dump you with me gherkin. No more I'll dig for praises. No longer I'll be food. Up the yard, there's a hover hay off you. Told me, brother, Seamus, I'll be off now. Keep going. Grand grow famous. And the more I have. Terrible. <laughs> Wednesday. Off to the Dingle Peninsula today to see Eddie Hutchinson, one of the last curra builders in the west of Ireland. He's also a champion rower, and this afternoon I'm going out practicing with him and the lads. I'm not even on my shoulders on it. <laughs> this is easy, Eddie. This is not that easy. I've only got half my head on anything. I'm doing fine now. Go right now, do me. Okay. More right. Okay. Oh. You better watch me, because my oars will fly all over the place. Yes. You put them on yet? Got it. That was a very nice deep pace out to go. Oh, we're in. I know, wait. Right. Put it away. Fucking with gas. Stay away. No way, come on, together. Yes, you know. Hold it there now, steady, mate. Well, the, I've always heard these called cutters, but on the dingle, you have a different word for them, what? Yes. No, wasn't it? Novax. No. Nivogs. Nivogs, we call them here. Nivogs. Nivogs. A four-handed Nivog. And this one's made of? This one is made out of canvas, tar, piranha pine that, and quite dead frame. So what you've got is a, what it looks like on the surface, a very flimsy boat. And yes, a very light boat. But like they're very useful around this part of the country because in the ports here you can't anchor a boat out in the water like here. You have to bring your back at night and carry it up in the safe ground. Like Is that because of the rough sea? The rough sea, like we have no re real bay here as well. So, I mean, this will stand up to quite heavy water, though, won't it? A boat like this. go up in any kind of water, like. Is that because it's more flexible than a wooden boat? Yeah. It'll bend in the waves, like. It'll go over the waves. It'll never go through them, like. It'll go over all kinds of waves. And it can carry about three tonne of mercury, like, yeah, on the one go, like. It'll carry three tonne and four men as well. That'll be about three thousand mercury. Have you never thought of it to get up to the Cambridge? Well, we can do about six miles here in about 30 minutes, like, yeah. That's with a good crew. That's 12 miles an hour, isn't it? Yes. Because you'd like they have the Dingle Regatta and uh, there's well, always... Well, the Dingle a... Regatta, like, you, you'll have about seven to eight crews in the Dingle Regatta in the main race there, like, yeah. yeah. Like, and uh, last Sunday we had 78 crews from all the West Coast, Galway, Clare, and all those, like. 78? Yes. And who won? Well, Clare beat us, by <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, keep it steady, lads, keep it steady. Steady now, steady, Mike, watch them. Just throw it in the back, Mike. <laughs> That's it, Mike. <laughs> I was only beaten once in the last 13 years, right here. So I leave my take over now. And he's doing a good hand it up to now, anyway. I was reading a book on the Aran Islands that the men who use the cutters there never learn to swim. Well, we never learn to swim, right here. And why is that? Well, we make out it safer 
out here if you went to the bottom like to about 300 feet of water like there and too much current yeah you don't even just that little bit two minutes later, longer like there why you never just win well i don't know i i, I can swim <laughs> <laughs> there's an old navy saying pull the ladder up i can swim <laughs> In the morning she rises And goes up in the air with the dew all on her breast And like a jolly ploughboy she'll whistle and she'll sing And go home of an evening with the dew all on her wing By the way, Mum, I was reading a book by a bloke called Flann O'Brien today. He was talking about the molecular theory. He said everything is made of molecules, and when a thing hits another thing, some of the molecules of the thing that does the hitting go into the thing it hits, and vice versa. He says the same thing happens with people on bicycles. He says the constant banging of people's backsides on the saddles of their bikes means that some people are part bicycle, and some bicycles are part people. I think I now know what he means. P.S. I think I've found Grandad. We were hoping to come, uh, was it Hollyhead or something like Hollyhead, that? Hollyhead, yeah. Yeah, and go across northern Wales there, because I know that's really pretty nice. It's pretty steep as well. Is it? <laughs> but the lovely thing about the uh, Healy Pass is that it, as you go and you're looking back down the valley, uh... I've seen the whole thing spread out below you. Although well, I didn't see too much of it, because I think mist when I came over oh, this morning. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> Where are you heading for? Waterville. We've seen a lot of people hitching today for Waterlooville. Is there anything going on over there? I hope not. We went between Glen Gareth and Ken Mare. Yeah? That, that straight, that other road. Over the top, yeah. yeah. That looks it was beautiful. It's really good. Isn't it a huge climb? No, it's very gradual. It's all a bit like this, you know, sort of. It's seesaws, it's very long. You know, it's, it's quite steep. You take a, a long run at it, you know? Uh -huh. If you're going back that way, it's worthwhile trying it. Thursday. Today, I got to Killarney. I thought I'd behave like a proper tourist and visit the lakes. Was this all Abbey lands? This, this was a national, uh, belonged to the late Colonel Herbert one time. And he built a big house in the estate, is known as Muckra's House. Oh, yeah. But in 1928, he presented the estate as a gift to the nation. Under the conditions, there'd be no motor cars allowed through, only government or pieces. People would be allowed to walk through sight yeah. through and go on the jumping cars. And to be a free national park for all nationalities, and above all especially, Good looking people will be loud through, so here we are. <laughs> and all my we were approaching what they call Muckra's House. The house was built in 1843 and it was the residence of Queen Victoria in 1861. It's the dead centre of Killarney. <laughs> I'm not very good with horses. I'm all right on bikes, but I'm not very good with horses. Does it legs let down so I can yeah. get on it? What's it called, this one? Misty. 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 Yeah. I was last night as well. Are you sure you shouldn't have steps or a ladder or something to get up? Is this one? Pretty sure. <laughs> Why not? Oh dear, mother dear, if you love me, come for me now. Yeah. No, you're right. Up. Now you're right. <laughs> See your steering wheel here now, is that? 
That's a steering wheel. Yeah, it fixed these up for you. I'm not very good with these things. There's no clutch on it or gear lever. Or... Where's the that's indicators? That's one. The last time I was on one of these, it was on runners, and I was just bouncing up and down on it. You look like you're born on a saddle. Oh, no way. <laughs> I like watching the cowboy film, but that's it. Right, I'll just set it off now, do I? Yeah, yeah. Where's the starter? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, that's it. Go on, that's right. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, he's all right. Do me this. First gear all the way. I'm riding round Killarney on 300 tins of dog meat. I'm going the right way for the glue factory. Come on, super glue. I didn't mean it about the dog meat. I didn't mean it about the dog meat, honest. Go on. Oh, come on. Come on. Come. Go on. Go on. Oh, you did it, no? Oops, steady. Come on, mister. You won't go any faster, will you? Go on. We like muffin, muffin, and you. Oh, give me a home where the leprechauns roam. Go on, mister. Go on. Nothing but blue skies do I see. There's a little green frog sitting on the water. Why? Little green frog doing what he ordered. He sits all day on the lily pad. Then he stops and he says, hey, fly. I'm a little green frog sitting on the water. Oh, God, God. You like that one? An unmusical horse. That's all I need. The last part of the trip started at Ross Castle. It seemed full of Americans looking for their granddads too. Are you going on the boat, sir? What? Are you going on the boat? Are you going on the boat? How much is it going to cost me? Oh, you saw Happy after the year. Oh, well, Happy that's all right. Yeah, I'll go. Before hey, the door. crush starts, that's all right. Can see Indian out there? Smash it. Indian out there. Back here to the cushions. Cromwell knocked about. What was that? Was the last castle he captured in Ireland? He, last castle, go, he yeah. came over to do a fair bit of knocking about. He, you know, he, 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 he mustn't have liked these castles and abbeys. Very much. Yeah, they burnt the abbeys down and broke open the castles, you know. But are you all quite safe on the trip anyway, right? We've had no bad accident for two weeks. Oh. I can't tell you what he lies in this trip. You might find it hard to believe. <laughs> but uh, there's a very strict tourist office in Killer Abbey Town. And a penalty for telling a lie is $30,000 for each lie that I tell you. I did for each lie that I tell you, I, they moved me back one seat in the boat. That's why he can't open his mouth. <laughs> As he's only got one more move left, out over the side. Is that so a life can if anything goes wrong? The fellow beyond was telling me, in all seriousness, now, I know it's a tourist trap, it's always about the leprechauns. Now, I, I, I can't have that. And, and I'm, oh, that's true, that's quite true. Do you ever see leprechaun? I've seen strange things, but it's only after that some of that fire water a man gave me the other night, you know. But... These mountains here are full of leprechauns. And a leprechaun is the old race of Irish people, and he's only six inches tall. And he wears a little green suit, a little red cap, 
<laughs> and she's very happy to see him with the trees. He's the one colour with the trees with the green suit. But uh, they're very numerous all along those mountains there. But uh, you don't see any rabbits. You, you don't see any, any rabbits along Killarney. Why is that? Well, no, there's a reason why the rabbits are very scarce along Killarney. That's the leprechaun's means of transport. They put little saddles up in their backs, and they go from town to town <laughs> up on the rabbit's backs. So if you're in Killarney now, tonight, around midnight, and you'll see a rabbit tied onto the pump, <laughs> no one's right. You know, on the other side, it's called the Guinness. That's the best time to see the leprechauns. It's at midnight. Oh, the they're just closing. Oh. Well, Mum, only a couple more days left now. Tonight, I'm going to a Cayley at the Eccles Hotel in Glengarriff with Johnny Crowley and his band. Try that one again, that dawn of the day, because it's a good, it's a good tune. That. Well, we'll go. Are you playing? I'll play along.
Dear Mum. Well, that's it. I'm on my way home now. I've had a fabulous time and the crack was something fierce. I've got a lot of very happy memories. Do you think will he make a good man in a shlaw? He will be very good, but he wants a good bit of practice. This type of life in Ireland is coming to an end in one way. So this is the Dutch one, is it? We do two legs back together, boy. That's it. But you wish how you were on me in nine days. I think I'll bring you next time, Mum. You better get polishing that bike. Your loving son, Mike. Mike Harding can be seen in his own regular show on Friday evenings at 9 o'clock on BBC Two. And next week, Ticket to Ride is taken up by Chris Searle from That's Life, when he takes a break in West Wales at 5.20 next Sunday. Back to today and in 10 minutes, episode 9 of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. <laughs>